I want to commend all the people here for a really fantastic event. This is what we should see across the country, a community coming together, um, veterans, police officers, both current serving and retired. I see a mix here, all kinds of veterans hats walking around in particular. How many folks here have ever served in the military or police or first responder community? There's a whole bunch of hands, right? So, but I always tell the veterans, wherever I go across America, it's the same message. That when you raised your right hand and swore your oath to support and defend the Constitution, when you took on the job, the duty of being a guardian of our republic, that oath does not expire until you do. So long as you're on this side of the grass, you have a duty and obligation to defend the Constitution. And you don't just do it while you're in service. That's certainly important. We reach out to the Marine Corps, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Coasties, and police officers. We're always urging them to remember their oath, and in particular, to know the Constitution. You can't defend it if you don't know it. And then we urge them to honor it by refusing unlawful orders. Things like we saw, we saw with Nuremberg, right? The Nazis tried to defend themselves by saying, I was just following orders. Well, that's no excuse. That's no, no valid defense. And Lieutenant Cowley in the, in the My Lai Massacre during Vietnam tried the same thing. He tried to say, I was just following orders. That also was not a valid defense for him either. And he was found guilty of war crimes. And then there was Warren Officer Thompson, the guy who helped stop the massacre, who we consider an oath keeper way back when. So this duty and obligation to defend the Constitution by refusing unlawful orders is something that we didn't make up. It's always been there. And I would have liked to have seen the police in Ferguson honor their oath by not imposing a curfew and not pointing sniper rifles at people, just as I would have liked to have seen the BLM down in Nevada not point sniper rifles at the Bundy Ranch family and their supporters. I don't care who it is. I don't care whether they're white, black, brown, pink, or purple. If their rights are being violated, we want the current serving to stand down and refuse to do that. That's a tough row, though. They're being conditioned just to obey. Now, the other side of our mission is to reach out to the veterans. And we tell them, you know, you guys who've been there and done that have a job and a duty to go reach out to the ones who are in service now and help them do it right. Like in, in Missouri, in reaction to the Ferguson incident, our Missouri chapter, including retired Missouri cops, got together and said, and put, put a letter together to the, to the governor saying, Governor Nixon, here's where you're screwing up. Here's where you're doing it wrong. Here's the right way to do it. And the right way, they said, is to put undercover officers out in the crowd and go after the actors, the actual guys, the few that are throwing Molotov cocktails. You don't do it by punishing all the peaceful protesters. You go after the actual bad guys. You do it with undercover officers, you do it smart. It's smart policing. So there's, this is a problem I see in the country over and over again, is a false paradigm or a false choice. Either you go along with a militarized police and heavy-handed military tactics that are actually worse than what we saw in Iraq or Afghanistan. I've had Iraq uh, veterans tell me that they saw more respect for the Iraqis than they have seen here domestically, like in Watertown after the Boston bombing. There's, they saw less respect for the American people than they saw given to the Iraq uh, people, people in Iraq. That's wrong. So we got to tell them, look guys, we appreciate your service. We, we value and respect what you do. But if you cross the line and start abusing the rights of the people, that's your only legitimate purpose government, as our declaration said, it exists solely to defend our rights. And when it becomes abusive of those rights, then it is wiped out its only purpose. It's illegitimate. And so we, we prefer to get the police and the military to understand that. And we know they have courage and honor. I served as a paratrooper in the Army. A lot of the guys here served in the Marine Corps, Army, Navy. We all serve with very brave people. There's no doubt they have courage. But what we're worried about is the lack of understanding. They're not taught the Constitution in public schools. It doesn't matter whether you're left or right on the political spectrum. All of you should be concerned for the lack of understanding of our history, of our Constitution, and in particular, our Bill of Rights. 
the people don't even understand, if you ask the average American what rights are protected by the First Amendment, you notice I didn't say granted, but if you ask them what rights are protected, I bet you they couldn't name more than one. They might get free speech. They, they'll miss freedom of, of, of assembly. They'll miss freedom of religion. They'll miss the right to petition your government for redis of grievances. I'll bet you they can't do it. How can we take a population like that and then they go into the military or they go into police service and expect them to actually defend what they swore an oath to with that lack of understanding? And so it's really important for all of you to take on the duty and responsibility of making sure they know the Constitution. It's critical. Bedrock. And same goes for the politicians. If you have a politician who can't tell you what's in Article 4, Section 4, for example, of the Constitution, who knows what that is? What is it? Border security. Well, it's the, the federal government um, is responsible for guaranteeing a Republican form of government and protecting the states against domestic violence upon petition by the governor or when he cannot do it, or by the legislature, when he can't do it by the governor against domestic violence and also protect them against invasion, as an example. But if you have a politician who doesn't know the Constitution, you, said, you should tell them, hey, go back to school. Once you know the Constitution, then you can take the oath. You don't take an oath to something you don't know. So it's your civic duty and responsibility as citizens to hold their feet to the fire and at least make sure they know what it says. But you can have knowledge. You can have, I went to Yale Law School and I had plenty of fellow students who were brilliant, who minds like computers. But if they don't have the courage to do what's right, once they know what's right, they will not do it. And that's why courage is the first virtue as Aristotle said. Courage comes first. Because without the courage, nothing else is gonna matter. You won't do it. So this is why your veteran community, not that you have to be a veteran to have courage, but at least every veteran has been willing to some degree or another to step up and put their life at risk for their country. As the saying goes, they wrote a blank check made out to the American people for an amount up to and including their lives. You need to respect that and honor that. But, but then you have to say, you've got the courage, Mr. Current Serving Marine, or Army, or Air Force, or veterans, but do you have the knowledge to know what's right? There are plenty of brave men in the German Army, I'm sure, but they followed egregious unlawful, violating natural law orders, didn't they? So you can have courage and still do the wrong thing. And we saw that during Katrina. We saw uh, police officers who were later on were, were, were convicted of murder for shooting people they should not have been shooting. We saw house-to-house uh, -house searches without warrants, confiscation of firearms from Americans who were just trying to protect themselves and their property. That was wrong. Just like it was wrong to have a police officer walking in front of a bunch of Occupy protesters with a big can of pepper spray and spraying them in the face. That's wrong. Make sure they know what that oath means. Make sure they know what the Constitution means. Do not accept the lie that their duty is to simply follow orders. That's like out of Nazi Germany. If the founders intended for their oath to mean, and the oath comes right out of the Constitution, it's right there in the Constitution itself. It mandates that every officer, every level of government must take an oath to defend the Constitution. If they had meant that that oath meant you must obey whatever and enforce whatever law is on the books, they'd have said so. They'd have said every officer must swear an oath to enforce whatever law is passed by the legislature. Plain and simple. That's not what they wrote. They all must take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. And that means they have an individual duty and responsibility to judge the lawfulness of the orders they're being given. Just like Lieutenant Cowley had an individual obligation and duty to judge the lawfulness of the orders he was given that day, or the night before the Milai massacre. 
You're not off the hook just because your commanding officer tells you to do it. You're not off the hook because the legislature passed the law. You're not off the hook because Governor Nixon declares an emergency and tells you to enforce a curfew that violates the rights of assembly and free speech and the press. You're still on the hook. You have a duty to say no. But what about your duty and responsibility? Where are the veterans at again? Show me who the veterans are. Earlier you heard from, from uh, Joseph and you heard from Tom about preparedness and why it's so important and urging you to get involved. I'm not going to ask you to get involved. If you swore that oath, you have a duty right now. It's not an option. It's not a maybe you could if you wanted to. It's a duty to get involved and to be engaged in your community to step up and take care of your fellow Americans. Because if you don't, look at, look at Katrina again. Why did you have so much constitutional violation? It's because the people of New Orleans were not prepared to take care of themselves. They were not prepared to provide for each other. And so it was a chaotic disaster and they were desperate. And so under those conditions, it's much easier, human nature being what it is, a police officer or soldier are more likely to go along with unconstitutional orders because they see it as a real emergency. So you have a duty and responsibility to step in and make sure there is not a vacuum of community preparedness. And, and to the preppers out there, if you're a prepper and your idea of being prepared is holding up in your basement with your pile of food and letting your neighbors starve or letting your, your town go to chaos around you, that's also, one, being negligent as an American, you have a duty as an American citizen to take care of your country. Two, it's also not going to help you. That's not going to save you. Holding up like a secret squirrel is not going to provide for your community security and ultimately not for your security either. You will eventually be raided by MS-13 or whoever else. So even if you're thinking about, you know, economic collapse and I've got my stuff and I don't care about anybody else, that's a fail. That's a failed plan. That's not going to work. The founders in their wisdom showed us the way a long time ago. What is their answer to emergencies? Who is responsible for taking care of the community in an emergency? Who's it supposed to be? All of us. That's right, you. You're supposed to be the posse for the sheriff. You're supposed to be the militia, the military power in the community. And that means all of you, not just a few. That, that's what they would consider a select militia. They understood that if you erect a separation between those fundamental functions of citizenship and the people, you will wind up with a dictatorship. They knew that if you relied only on professional police and professional military and abdicate those duties, you won't be secure in the end. There's not enough cops to make you secure. Then you also won't be free. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. You've got a duty responsibility to step up and be the security for your community. Neighborhood watches, like Sheriff Gilbertson's going to start, is a bedrock foundation of that absolutely the most critical thing you can do right now. More important than anything else you're doing is do you have a neighborhood watch? Do you know your neighbors? Are you working together? But when you do that, it's not just about guns and ammunition, things like that. It's also about radios. It's also about emergency power. It's also about um, emergency medical supplies. When you have a disaster of any kind, what gets parachuted in? Water, medical supplies, and communication. Right? lost my mic. So you have got to make sure that you've got all those bases covered. And that's why with Oath Keepers, we started what we call our CPT program, and that stands for Community Preparedness Teams. And all it really is is us leading by example, doing what we want you to do. I don't care if you join Oath Keepers. That's not the point. What I want you to do is say, okay, look at what they're doing. You take what, If you like it, take it and replicate it. Use it in your church group your civic association, I don't care if it's the Kwanas, the Toastmasters, whatever it is. Use that template as an example for you to get squared away. And we model it in part on what a Special Forces A team does because they understand logistics. They're not just about running around blowing things up and shooting stuff. They have two combo guys on the team. That way they have redundancy. They've got two medical guys on the team. 
and they've got two engineers on the team who can make sure there's, there's power and clean water and take care of hazmat, all that kind of stuff. That's what we're trying to do also. So I encourage you to consider your family as the first team. That's your first team. You and your family are the first team. Do you have someone in your family who knows at least the basics of emergency medical? Have you at least trained in CPR? Do you know basic trauma? Have you guys been in the military? It's combat lifesavers, the first level. In your family, someone has to be either knowing that or on the track to learning it. Like in my family, we saw a deficiency, so my teenage son and I both went down and took the EMT classes at the local community college. So we knew we had to fill that hole, that, that, that empty spot in our own families. So I encourage you to do the same in yours. Someone has got to be the medical person. Also, someone's got to be the combo person. Someone's got to go and take that ham technical license class and, and get the radios, learn how to use them, and then teach everybody else in the family. That's what SF does. They all go specialize and then they cross train. So they all have a basic understanding of all the other jobs. They can do them, but then they got their specialist. Someone in your family should take on the engineering function. That's emergency power, clean water, dealing with hazardous material, turning off the gas, etc. And on that note, the CERT classes that FEMA gives are pretty damn good. I know a lot of guys don't like FEMA, but the CERT classes aren't bad. Jeff here has taken one here in Oregon through his sheriff's department. I encourage Sheriff Gilbertson to look into that as an additional uh, resource for you here. You can go to online classes that, that, that have, you know, CERT is online. You can also do them in person. They teach you how to turn off the gas, how to turn off the power, really good basic self-help. And why? Because FEMA realized, this is one thing they got right, is they realized that it's going to take at least 72 hours or more for any outsiders to respond to a disaster area. Look at the flooding in, in Colorado. Look at the mudslide they had up there in Washington State. It takes time to get in all the resources there to help people. People have got to be able to self-rescue, and they've got to be able to self-help. And like I said earlier, what do you need under those kind of duress? Medical, communications, clean water, and shelter. Those are the big ones, you know? So in your family, that's your first team, get that squared away. What does FEMA leave out, though, in a CERT program? What's left off the table? Security. They understand the need to self-rescue and self-help when it comes to all that other stuff, because no one's going to get to you in time, but they leave off the table security. And they basically say, kind of a weird disconnect, oh, for those things you have to self-rescue. When it comes to your security, oh no, you better call the police. Well, how are the police going to get to you? They'll be overwhelmed too, or inaccessible. If you have an earthquake here, you can be isolated in this valley, right? This is the way it's going to be. Like the folks in, in Colorado in the flood, they were stuck and isolated by the flood. So you've got to have security on the table in your family. Someone has got to take on the responsibility of being the security person in your family and then cross-training everybody else. And what does that mean? Well, that could mean basic learning how to shoot. That could mean learning how to use alternate force like pepper spray, less than lethal. There's all kinds of stuff. It also means learning about the mental aspects of self-defense and security, about lighting and good locks and all that stuff. It's, it's broad spectrum. But I really, in particular, want to prick the conscience of everyone here who's an infantry veteran. When it comes down to looters, when it comes down to MS-13 rolling through and raping and pillaging, or the cartels like we're seeing starting to happen now, on our side of the border, unfortunately, just like in Mexico, what it's going to take is infantry skills. It's just the way it is. And up in Eureka, Montana, where I live, we've got a CPT team that has retired nurses on it, um, retired firefighters, really good squared away people, a lot of knowledge, but no knowledge of any of that kind of stuff. And so I've taken it upon myself as infantry veteran to pass on what I know, because if two nurses are rolling down the road on the way to go deliver some medicine and they're run off the road by a bunch of gangbangers in a truck or a bunch of redneck, you know, um, prepper pirates that want to take their meds, whoever it is, 
They have got to know how to defend themselves and fight as a team. A husband and wife, if you're attacked in your home or out there on the street, you got to know how to work as a team. And most firearms courses, self-defense courses, teach you how to work only as an individual. They don't teach teamwork. And I think it's because they're afraid of being perceived as extreme or teaching military tactics. The founders intended that the people, all of you, were the militia. You are all supposed to be, and what is a militia? It's light infantry. You are all supposed to have those basic skills. And you need them for personal self-defense against bad guys, but you need them especially for community security. If there is a grid down situation and Sheriff Gilbertson needs the veterans to step up in this community and other dedicated people in this community, he would prefer that you be trained and know how to work effectively together without shooting yourself or each other by accident being competent and being able to actually handle a situation. What if, God forbid, you had a grid down situation and an isolated ranch or home was attacked by MS-13, and you know they're out there. They're, running, they're starting to run your guys' marijuana crop up here, right? The cartels are moving in. So it's not beyond the pale, and he just told, in fact, this morning, Sheriff Gilbertson told me about two recent home invasions where the home invaders dressed like cops and invaded people's homes and robbed them. So stuff happens. If you do learn how to move, shoot, and communicate as a team, husband and wife, father and son, two friends, and then you learn how to do that as a team of four, that's your building block right there. That's the foundation. Out of that can come a squad if you need to, and the sheriff's posse will be competent. When he needs you, you'll be able to step up and help him. But even now, in your everyday life, it could save your life against crime. So I want us to set aside any fear or hesitation in the minds of the American people to go and learn these skills. The people who don't want you to learn those skills, they don't want you to learn those skills because they want you dependent. They want you dependent on them. They either, they either don't trust you or they look down their nose at you, or they fear you. Whatever their problem is, it's not your problem, it's their problem. Let them talk all they want. You infantry veterans have a duty to pass on those skills and train your fellow Americans. And the rest of you should take advantage of what they have to offer and let them teach you. These are life-saving skills. And it's not about being a wannabe Rambo and a bunch of drama, it's being competent. And you men especially, you have a responsibility to be able to take care of your family. It's your duty. And I train women all the time too. But I'll tell you, you guys, you're, you're on the hook. You've got a duty responsibility to know how to fight. Because when it comes right down to it, if you have to fight, you better be able to do it right or your family dies. So just the other day in, in Oklahoma, we had a lady decapitated by a former employee who ran back into the business and cut her head off. If only, luckily, the shop manager, luckily the shop manager was a reserve deputy and had a rifle in the car, ran through the car and got it and killed the guy before he could kill anybody else. But it'd been much better if he'd have had his pistol on him and shot him in the first place and stopped that attack. Be responsible. Step up and take the responsibility to be a guardian, not just of yourself, but your fellow Americans. Right. And so what I see here today, in closing, this is really a phenomenal example of what should be happening across the country. The American people must come together as a community. Rather than being atomized little families that don't talk to your neighbors, reach out to your fellow Americans. There are more good guys than there are bad guys. But if the good guys are not organized, then the bad guys will enjoy an artificial monopoly or superiority of force when they come to your house. But if you organize with your neighbors, and this is the lesson of the people of Michoacan, Mexico. They have showed us the right way. They had corrupt pol politicians who would not protect them, corrupt police through the back pocket of the cartels. They, had, they, they finally realized when the cartel, 10 cartel members can come and terrorize one family. And they had 100 cartel members terrorizing a town of like 7,000 people. Then they realized, hey, we outnumber them. When they finally rose up, the cartel ran and hid. 
because they were outnumbered by the people. They're more good guys than bad guys, but the good guys must be organized. And that goes for the whole spectrum of your preparedness. You must do it as a community. All right, thank you. Oh, any, any questions for me at all? Or who's the next speaker? Any questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Stuart? Yeah. Can you share your experience at Bundy Ranch about what, how close we were to a, a catastrophe? Well, I don't really want to go into Bundy Ranch too much. This is, we're trying to just focus on more positive stuff. Okay, I'll talk about it. Why not? Okay, at Bundy Ranch, like I said earlier, just like at Ferguson, we had violations of rights. You had sniper rifles being pointed at people who were simply protesting. You had the same situation at Bundy Ranch. You had some pretty gross violations of the First Amendment. And I didn't, it wasn't about whether or not he paid his grazing fees or, or whether or not he owned the land or had, a, had, had water rights. That wasn't why the veterans showed up. And I got right here in the audience right here today is Brandon Rapolo. Hey, Brandon, say hi. Brandon rolled down there from up here. Hey, Brandon, come up here for a second. I'm going to have him tell you why he went down there. If you don't mind, just tell him why you went down there. And when I, I talked to veterans from across the country who went there, it was seeing militarized military contractors like, like, like out of Iraq pointing sniper rifles at a, at a ranching family. It was violations of the First Amendment. That's why they went, and they were concerned about another Waco tragedy. That's what they were concerned about. And that's why I went. But Brandon can tell you why he went. So I'll try to keep this short. My name's Brandon Rapola. I'm out of Springfield, Oregon. And uh, probably a few years ago, just getting involved with, uh, with local militia. Um, excuse me getting involved with local militia and a national militia and just trying to be aware of, of our communities. And let me, let me explain that uh, serving in the military, you understand our government, uh, understand our great country and, and what you're willing to, to do for it. And I think it comes down to um, just having a sense of pride of, of what all of our, our forefathers have done and military members, the risks that people have done and between losing their lives, with the effects of family members, the effects of, of everybody around that. And seeing stuff and being aware of, of what's been happening on the local levels, um, it just kind of makes you want to get more involved. And fortunate enough, the group of us more involved in order, when the Bundys did a national call out, we actually were able to share that information with each other. If I had not been my, on my own to get involved, I would have not have known about it. None of us would have been able to share it. But it was because I was proactive myself, not waiting for somebody to tell me. So that's really what I can, I try to stress to people. You have to, on your own, get involved and get with like-minded people and that you can share that information. Like, hey, I, I posted videos on YouTube from, uh, um, on my YouTube, Brandon Rapoli, you can go to him of my of stuff that was happening and the things that I've tried to point out to people. If you don't tell people that you need help, I don't know that. You're gonna have people that are willing to come with weapons, not just not to we're not anarchists, but if you're if you're being opposed and threatened by another force, you know what? We'll stand there and bleed for you. Let, let me explain that to you. That we will stand there, not the people out there, I can see, you'll stand there and bleed for me because we understand what this oath means. That it wasn't, it's not something you just sign on the dotted line and, and, and it's a contract and I don't like the contract, I throw it away. There's a reason why uh, my good friend Rance, another jarhead, said we had a sense of duty, that's why we joined and, and once we joined that even enhanced what we thought and why we love, why we are patriotic and why we love America. Um, and with that, people are willing to do and stand there. And you just have to have the courage to say something. Bundy's had the courage to say something and the national call out. And, you, you know, it's not like it's a 1-800 number. It's just people that are intermingling, twining with each other saying, hey, this guy needs help. I didn't know. I don't know anything about ranching. I don't even know anything about the Bundy's. But the thing I only had to see is the First Amendment zone and the physically harming another citizen. Because I tell you what, my good friend Silk and you, when, when he, he found out about it too, he was like, 
us, you know, we, I was a scout in the first line recon battalion, and I was a, a, a barracks duty in Japan, security forces. But it never, when civilians came around, we treated them as, as they were kings, because that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do, is to protect you. And to see other uh, federal government agencies to do that, they, did, they lost that sense of your purpose is to support the American people and to help them thrive. So if I were to go there, I didn't know, know nothing. I said, you know what, if it was some crazy rancher that was psycho, then I could turn around and leave. But you know what, I'll drive 18 hours straight, throw my gear in, I tell you what, I was just talking to good friend Sean there. I said, man, when I thought I was prepared and ready because I keep my gear ready, you still, I couldn't do it fast enough. Once we put our gear in, went there, the, the purpose was simply to say, you are not going to harm these people. Whatever the problem is, you're not gonna open fire on them. Your intimidation with your tactical gear, guess what, doesn't intimidate me. Didn't intimidate any of those other guys. And you can think with your fancy gear that these American people are gonna be intimidated. Well, you know what, we're not gonna be intimidated. And it was very key that it didn't hit me until a local rancher from Colorado, he, you know, he was carrying his little, his little pistol and he goes, I'm here because you're here. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I, what you have and what you guys are able to use, I don't. I have my pistol to shoot rattlesnakes or if a cow's down to take him out of his misery. What they were opposing us with, it scared me. So I see the gear, I'm like analyzing like, okay, they have this, that, this, cool, all right. And realize civilians, what that does. And that's not what, what us is, is as agencies are supposed to do is, is putting fear in our local citizens. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, hey, I should be able to go to help. So the town meeting, one of the town meetings, the lady said, hey, I called the senator. They said, you gotta take that stuff with the BLM. I called the, the governor, take it up with the BLM. I called the Metro police, take it up with the BLM. State police, take it up with BLM. They said, I didn't feel safe until the militia came into town. And you had people that had no idea, had no awareness of who was gonna show up. I didn't know if I was going to be the only guy with my other buddy that was in the Marine Corps and, and a uh, uh, guy that was uh, during the Vietnam era. I mean, shoot, we didn't know if we were going to be the only ones. Because there isn't like this, it's just by word of mouth and who's going to, who can show, who's going to show. And so that's what I try to tell people. You have to, first of all, have the courage to say, I need help. Okay. And then from there, us together as community can help each other because every single one of your militia, you know, people, people, some of the Occupy people, are like, hey, are you, are you, uh, uh, militia people going to come help us? I'm like, you guys can help yourselves. You just have to be proactive in how you're going to do it. Yeah, we're all here. Test. Okay. So. Test. Okay. Test. So really, it's it's we have to be more proactive with each other, and you're not anarchists. You locally, we can help each other. Help the local law enforcement, the sheriffs, make sure they're they're doing their part of the oath to the Constitution intermingle with state patrol, intermingle with, with the state police, uh, sorry, the, uh, the city police, and be involved with each other. And, uh, and that's really just trying to get, it's, it's, it can't be a secret. You know, I used to try to, my views quiet because I was like, man, am I going nuts and crazy? And I realized I'm not going nuts and crazy, okay? And I need to be able to be vocal and let other people know that there's other people that are thinking the same way so that, that we can't be quiet. We have to say, hey, how can we intermingle with each other? You know, talk to each other, and it's just being prepared. You, you don't have to be part of the militia. Being prepared for local disasters, helping each other, helping your community, and so that's really kind of, you know, trying to hammer into people. We got, we have to get off the couch. We have to do that, and uh, and it's not just for yourselves, but it's for each other. Because if somebody's knocking on my door, I got to know that I can be able to call people and say, hey, you know what? I'm getting a little intimidated by what's happening right now. And I shouldn't have that feeling. I shouldn't have a weapon pointed at me because maybe I didn't pay something. You know, that's, that's kind of a big deal. That's all I got, Stuart. Thank you.